Well, good morning, my friends, and welcome to River Church Online Worship. I'm Pastor Randy Caulfield, and here in River Church's building, we'll be worshiping in a few hours, but we're making this video available to you, those of you that are still self-isolating, because we want you to be a part of the family. We want you to be a part of our worship service. Uh, so I'm glad, I'm, I'm honored, in fact, that you invited me into your home this morning. I encourage you now to, to go uh, before we get started and get a Bible and something to write with, something to write on, maybe fill up your coffee cup, uh, get rid of distractions. Um, if you have any questions about River Church, you can go to our website, riverchurchrgv.com, and all things River Church can be found there, riverchurchrgv.com. Okay, well, you get yourself ready, and we'll get rolling here in just a minute. Welcome to this week's installment of The Great Exchange, a walk through the stories of the Bible. I'm having a good time with this sermon series. I hope you are as well. I just find it so intriguing that this great exchange, this storyline runs throughout the entire Bible from the Old Testament through the New Testament. We, team, we tend to think that the gospel story, the story of Jesus, which is just really the phrase, a great exchange is referencing the story of Jesus, we tend to think that's, you know, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or it's maybe just confined to the New Testament. What I want to lead you to believe and as, we, as we study God's Word is, is this storyline of the great exchange, how God interacts with humanity, it, it runs throughout the entire Bible from, the first, from page one to the end of the book of Revelation. The great exchange. Now, at this, week, at this point, uh, every week, I give you uh, a story of a, of a lesser, although maybe great, exchange that I've uh, partaken of, uh, some, some, some deal that I made in my, in my life. I'm eventually going to run out because I'm not that much of a wheeler dealer, but here's my fifth story. Hope you enjoy them. Um, it was, the year was 1991, and Lydia and I had only been married a few weeks. We've, I've been married to my precious bride now for almost 30 years. Um, but we were newly married. We were living in Abilene, Texas, because that's where we had gone to college. Uh, and we received a wedding gift from a family in the church that we attended. They were a dear family, and they got us a really nice gift. Uh, but the fact is, it was this small appliance. Uh, it, was, it was a crock pot. And we had already received a similar but better small appliance. And so we decided we don't, we don't need this. And so we did what all good Americans uh, do. We determined, let's take it back to Walmart and, and see if we can get some money back. Uh, or see if we can exchange it for uh, some other small appliance that we might need that might be useful to us. So we do that. We did that, and it was supposed to be fun. You know, it's it's kind of it, it's kind of embarrassing now, but you know how it is when you're when you're newly married. You go everywhere together, right? You, you get up and make breakfast on Saturday mornings together. You go you go shopping together. You 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 you. you do the laundry together. Lydia says, Randy, when did you ever do the laundry? But, but that's another story. Well, you know, you do everything together. It's kind of sappy, but it's just the way it is when you're newly married. So Saturday morning, here we go, trekking to Walmart together, probably hand in hand, and we're standing in line. Standing in line at the Walmart in Abilene, Texas on a Saturday morning when guess who walks in? Yep, you, you guessed it. The husband and wife of this family that given us this gift. And now it doesn't sound like that big of a deal, but at the time it was so awkward. I'm only 22 and I don't know what to do. I'm holding the gift, clearly the gift that they had given us. They were pretty good friends of ours and they knew what was going on and we knew what was going on. And at the moment it was just awkward. What do you do? Do you hide from them? Do you change churches? No, I'm just kidding. You just have to work through the awkwardness, right? And we laughed about it and they laughed about it. And it turned out to, to be not that big of a deal. But the point is we made an exchange that day. Perhaps not a great exchange, uh, but we made an exchange. We, I, th I think we got a wok like to cook Chinese food. That was all the rage back then. We got a wok in exchange for a, our crock pot. And that's, that, was, that was our Saturday morning, newly married, 1991. Now, the great exchange that we're talking about in the Bible, obviously, exponentially greater. We could talk a lifetime of this great exchange and not grow tired. It's all over the pages of the Bible. It's the story of God exchanging the debt of sin that we owe for the righteousness of Christ. He takes from us our, our, our sin the penalty, the debt that we owe, and he gives us, in exchange, Christ's righteousness. It'd be enough, I suppose, if he just wiped 
the, the slate clean and, and, and cancel out the sin. But no, he, he does more than that. He gives us, he places on us the righteousness of Christ. Just so we make sure we're talking about the same thing, let's look at 2 Corinthians 5. It tells this story. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says, For our sake, he, God, made him Christ. For our sake, God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is the story of the Bible, my friends, that God takes from us this debt of sin that we owe, cancels it out, and in its place he puts the righteousness of Christ. And that's how he sees us now. There are two hurdles that we must clear if we are to put our faith in Jesus. I spoke of them last week. The one main hurdle first main hurdle that we have a hard time clearing is this. We have a hard time believing that we actually owe a debt for our sin. I mean, let's be honest. You know, we look at it and we, we look at our lives and we say, yeah, you know, I may be bad, but I'm not bad like some people bad. Do I really have a debt of sin that I've accrued, that I owe? That's one hurdle. The second hurdle that that we really have a hard time clearing is this idea that God's actually going to call this debt. He is actually going to call us out on this debt. That we're actually have gonna, gonna have to one day make payment on this debt. Does God really do that? Why doesn't he just like sweep it under the rug? He's actually going to expect us to pay down this debt. The big theological word is substitutionary atonement. That means that that Christ is our substitute atonement. He went to the cross and paid the penalty for our sin so that we don't have to, and now we get his righteousness. He is our substitute, substitutionary atonement. So there's two, two hurdles we have to clear. We, we're going to be talking about that a lot over the course of this entire year. Do we really owe a debt? And do we really have to make good on that debt? And the answer is yes and yes. So this is week five. Um, and the, the, the title of the sermon is, I am the Lord, and then three subtitles, Slow to Anger, Showing Love to, to the Many, Not Leaving Sin Unpunished. Here's the, here's the, the, the back story. Um, <clears throat> this young uh, nation of Israel, the Hebrews, they're now, uh, ex the book of Exodus, they're now heading, leaving Egypt where they were slaves and heading to the promised land. Now, if you've seen the movie, The, uh, the Prince of Egypt, you, you remember that Pharaoh had, had locked them in as, as, as slaves and now God had busted them out and they're freed people. The, 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 they're moving, to, they're headed to the promised land. They're God's chosen people, the young, budding nation, the Hebrews. They don't know God. They've had no writings to, 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 to read about him. They have not really heard from him in a while, and now he's leading them in the desert, and they don't know God. And Moses, their leader, uh, you know, he carried that staff that would turn into a snake, and they, God used him to part the Red Sea. Moses is like, God, if I'm going to lead these people through the wilderness to the promised land, I need to know who you are. Who are you? And so God um, determines to reveal himself. And here's how he does, here's how he describes himself to the nation of Israel. Exodus, Exodus 34, the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, and here's what he says about himself. He proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Amen. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. If we read the next verse, we're not going to, but what it says is that in response to that, Moses falls to the ground, bows his head toward the, towards the earth, and worships. Now, context. Again, the young 
nation of Israel. I mean, understand, they had now only been freed for a few months. They'd, when, when this was written, when, when the Lord said this, they'd only been on the road now for a few months. The young nation of Israel, the backstory is they had already, in just a very short amount of time, they'd already been so unfaithful to the Lord. They had doubted him. They had complained against him. They had spoken ill of his leaders. That's Moses and Aaron. And, and it sounds to me, sadly, uh, familiar because some of us, that's how we roll. That's just an average year in the life of a Christian. We complain against the Lord. We complain about what he's given us and what he hasn't given us. And, and, and often even the leaders that he's put over us. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's your story. Maybe you can relate um, that's not the main, uh, the main point, and not that we relate in our, in our brokenness, although I think we can. Um, but another way that I think we can relate is how we see God in the midst of all that ugliness. How we view or misview God in all of that brokenness and complaining and sorrow. And, see, we, here's what we do. It's, you, you'll see it in the story of, of the nation of Israel today. Here's what we do. We, we make up a God who is not exactly aligned with the God of the Bible. But that's what they did. That's what we do. We'll, we'll see that today. But they, we make up a belief system about God that does not in any way square with who he says he is. Remember who he says he is? I'm the Lord. I'm I'm slow to anger and forgive the many, and I, yet I do not let sin go unpunished. How do we do that? How do we paint for ourselves a picture of God who doesn't quite square with who God says he is? Well, here's one example. You can read. say, God, how could you let this happen? You must not be good. Well, if you check out what God says in the Bible, it says that God says, I am certainly capable of being good all the time, even though bad things happen all the time. But when we make up our own God identity, we, we leave parts out. Like we leave some aspects of who God is, we leave, and, and then a certain other traits of a God we, we highlight. We downplay other traits and we make a God into who we think he should be rather than who he really is or who he even claims to be. And, and we'll see that. That's what the Hebrews did. They're wandering in the desert and they, they, they having just walked through the middle of the Red Sea, uh, a dry seabed, God parted the Red Sea and they hadn't forgotten that. But somehow, even in the midst of that miraculous event, there's this drift, this mindset that says, well, yeah, God miraculously parted the Red Sea, but what has he done for me lately? What has he done for me lately? And we do the same thing. Most of us, we could, you could tell me a story of how God has worked so clearly in your life. So, dare I say, miraculously. And yet, I would bet that many of you have experienced an emotional drift and he doesn't seem that amazing to you anymore. I mean, you wish that he did, but he doesn't seem that, that tremendous or that terrifying. Right now, he's just boring. He isn't all he was in, in, in the seat of your affections. Like if there's a if there's like a throne room in your heart, you know, it, he's not sitting on the throne. It, your affections have grown cold. And I would dare say that that's because you have had this mental shift and you don't see God accurately through the lens of Scripture, how he describes himself. In other words, a cold heart often flows out of our belief system. So God tells Moses that day, you tell the Hebrews who I am. You tell my people who I am. I'm the Lord. And then one, two, three. Slow to anger. Forgive the many, but I do not let sin go unpunished. 
So here's the big idea. There's really just one big idea in today's message. Here's the big idea, and that is in order to know God fully and experience him at the deep level that I trust we want, we must get to know God accurately and, and fully, completely. And embrace the fact that God, he is who he says he is and not who I sometimes make him out to be in my own mind. Now I realize that sounds almost simplistic, right? Just see the God, see God accurately, you know, according to how he describes himself. That sounds simplistic. And, and yet, if there's one great mistake that we make, it's this, to our own demise. We make up a God in our mind who he never intended to be. We make a God of our own fashioning, and sometimes we make a God even of our own likeness. Like we say, he must be like us. He must be like me. And the God that we make up in our brain is not the God of the Bible. He's a man-made creation. W.A. Tozer speaks of just the, 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 the significance, the depth of the importance of seeing God accurately. Here's what W.A. Tozer says. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The most determining fact about any man is not what he, he at any given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. What W.A. Tozer is saying is what you think about God how you perceive God, that is a big deal. Now, here's how we make a mistake. Here's how we get this all messed up. Sometimes we take a piece of scripture and we actually use it against God. Huh. Well, we take a piece of scripture and we make him into a God we think he should be, but we leave out other parts of scripture that contradict what we want to say about God. And you do this, I do. We, we do this in our theological arguments with our friends at times. I'll give you one example that maybe won't, it'll take the heat off a little bit because uh, I don't want to be too hard on you or me either. Uh, but, but here's one example that you've seen, and it kind of, kind of, uh, it kind of makes the point. Um, the passage that you see at football games and, and on uh, com uh, TV commercials or whatever, uh, we see it in pop culture all the time. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's a great verse. The Apostle Paul wrote it. We see it on football helmets. We see it handwritten with Sharpies on basketball sneakers. And it's often paired with like spiking the football in the end zone, followed by like a full-on leg dab, if that's even a thing. Uh, you know, you, you see the, 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 the end zone dance Maybe you'll see it in the Super Bowl today, later on. And then, and then they flash that, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's the picture of like God's on my side. He's on my team. Do you know the dialogue and the drama actually surrounding that passage in the Bible? Philippians 4.13. It's written by the Apostle Paul. And it certain wasn't, you know, when he had, he had sold his like 1,000th tent. He was a tent maker sold his 1,000th tenth, and then he's got it like on his commercial, I can do all things through. It wasn't that at all. The context, the dialogue, the drama is this. Paul in that passage is talking about how to endure suffering. How, how, how to survive a night's sleep in the cold when you don't have a blanket, when your belly is, isn't full because you're out of money and you're out of work and and, and you're out of friends. And Paul says in that passage, at that moment, he says, in those times, in those times I have come to realize that, quote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, we take that passage and we think God's on my side and everything's always going to go well. And what happens when things don't go well? We decide, well, I guess God isn't on my side. And what Paul is saying is, I realize that even in want, even when I run out of stuff, even when I'm in need, I can, I can lean back on the Lord and he will get me through this. You see, we take passages and we misconstrue them 
and we make them say what we want, who we want God to be. One of the biggest ways that we creatively and ignorantly make God into someone else is by mashing up a few Bible passages and then leaving others out, and then we got a God that we want, but not necessarily the God of the Bible. For instance, I'll give you another example. The Bible says that God is love and justice. God is love and justice. He is committed to love and justice. And I'm going to tell you, if you read through your Bible this year, you will see that time and time again, that God is committed to love. God is committed to just justice. But we, we take that out of context. And so usually you either weigh pretty heavily on one, pretty heavily on the other. You either make God out to be judgmental because God's about justice. He's justice seeking. He's a harsh ruler. He's going to ultimately zap all of my, all the people that don't agree with me on whatever issue is your, your big issue. He, God's God of justice. And you lean real heavily on that. Uh, or sometimes we make him out to be a puny, pushover, doesn't take sin very seriously. It's not that big of a deal. And we make him to be in love, kind of a passive, pushover, puny God. Like, like the pet owner. You've seen the pet owner who's, who's always, like the pet's always disobeying and the owner sheepishly just always excuses. He's having a bad day or, you know, no really ability to control the pet. And so it's just embarrassing because the, the pet owner is, is just puny and, and passive and, and, and the pet actually runs the show. And we make sometimes God out to be this puny, peace-loving God, and we forget that he's, he's a God of justice. He one day makes right every wrong. There's a character in the Bible, in the Old Testament, by the name of Jonah. He's famous because he was, uh, we say, swallowed by a whale. Remember that Jonah in the belly of the whale? That guy? Well, Jonah made the same mistake that I'm talking about of painting a picture of God that did not square with Scripture. And it really led to a difficult season in Jonah's life. Now, here's Jonah's story. He was to go and evangelize um, the, uh, the, the, the city of Nineveh. And he actually takes the passage that we just read today, and he takes it out of context, and he leaves parts out, and he misconstrues it, and, and, and ultimately, it, it does not go well for him. Okay, here's the backstory, quick backstory of Jonah. Jonah hated the Assyrian city of Nineveh. So when God instructs Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh and preach repentance, forgiveness to the city of Nineveh. And by the way, he hated the city of Nineveh because Nineveh, the Assyrians, they were enemy, his enemies. They were enemies of his nation and they, they treated them, mistreated them. And he didn't want to go preach. He didn't want to see them saved. He wanted to see them burn. And, and so, so when God instructs uh, Jonah, go to the city of Nineveh, your enemies, and preach repentance and preach God's love, and preach forgiveness. You know what Jonah did? He set sail in the opposite direction, literally. He got, on a, he got on a ship and he went the opposite direction from Nineveh. I'm going to get as far away from God's will as I possibly can. And God sends a storm. And the sailors toss Jonah overboard into the sea. A large fish swallows him and then spits him up on dry land. And then Jonah goes straight to Nineveh and he preaches God to these godless people. And guess what happens? God mercifully saves them. God withholds judgment on the city. And Jonah's reaction, he is angry. It's embarrassing, but he's angry. He really hated those people. They were enemies of his homeland, mistreated his people, mistreated his family. And he hated them. And, and, and so Jonah 4, we read this. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord. Is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew, I knew you would do this. He says, I knew that you were gracious. You are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. 
Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life. <laughs> What's Jonah doing? He's throwing a pity party, feeling sorry for himself. He is quoting the passage that we read today. Ah, oh, Lord, you're slow to anger. You show love to the many. You're just a pushover God. But what does he leave out? He leaves out part of verse 7, which says that God does not leave sin unpunished. Why? Because Jonah's trying to paint a weak picture of God. He's saying, you're such a pushover, God. You let people get away with murder. And, 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 and I, Jonah says, I think if, if I were God, I would be a better God than you are, God, because I would, I would punish the city of Nineveh, but not you because you're pushover. And he leaves out the important part that God says, no, no, I offer love and repentance to the many, but ultimately I call people out on the debt of sin that they owe. And Jonah's approach, misconstruing who God is, really lying about God, using scripture to do so, that approach doesn't lead to anything good. Nothing productive comes out of remaking God into a convenient talking point. In fact, the end result, you saw it, Jonah asks, can, can I just die now, God? Why? Because what we think think about God, it's a big deal. And here's an interesting truth. When we grumble, complain, deeply satisfied with life in general, do you know that the Bible says that our real beef isn't with life, our real beef is with God? How we view God at that moment in time is, is it's not so favorable. When, when you're grumpy, when I'm grumpy, no, no one wants to be around you. Your you, you real problem is not with your family. Your real problem is with God. That's what the Bible says. You're saying, God, you aren't very good. And God, your ways aren't very good. And God, your plan, your plan stinks. And I don't want anything to do with your plan right now. All too familiar at times, right? Maybe you're living in that stage, that, that sort of uh, place right now. So back to the nation of Israel. Back to the, the story of Moses. Uh, Moses told the Hebrews, when you are grumpy and you are complaining about the harsh desert climate, and when you're complaining about a lack of water, he says to them, he says, listen, Moses, to the, to the Hebrew, listen, you, your problem isn't with me. You, your problem is with God. Take it up with God. I'm just a messenger. <laughs> I mean, if we, if we just review their complaining, I'll do that. In just a, just a few short months, I mean, they, they, they were captive, slave, beaten, mistreated in a systematic way a few months ago. Now they've been busted out of that. They're free men, free women, free children. And in just a few months, a few months here's, here's the complaining that had gone on. First off, the Red Sea incident. You see, before God split the Red Sea... They were, being, they were being chased by the, uh, the, he, the, the Egyptian chariots, and they come to the edge of the Red Sea, and they're, now they're, they're locked in. And, and Red Sea, and they, they we are trapped, and we're all going to die. And they say, why did you bring us out here? And then Exodus 14, verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? You get that? They want to go back to slavery. What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. Wow. I mean, that is scary and, and, and yet somewhat familiar. 
we, we look at how God has delivered us out of our old lives and how he's given us a new life and eternity in heaven and how he's just remaking us and forming. And yet, and yet there are times where like, I just wish I could go back to the old way of life. Second example in the nation of Israel in their young history, uh, water is scarce and they grumble and they complain and they consider killing Moses. Uh, and this is a, a big deal. I mean, they, they were herdsmen and they had livestock, cattle, and the cattle had to drink water. And, and now, such a big deal, they're thinking, maybe we got to kill Moses. <laughs> and then another example, Moses left them for over a month to meet with God on a mountain and get their marching orders, get the Ten Commandments and get the covenant. And he's coming back with the, with the, 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 the stone at tablets. And, and well, he was gone so long, they got nervous. And they said, forget Moses, uh, let's make up our own God. And so they made this, this golden calf and they begin uh, partaking in what's called pagan revelry, which really means like wicked pagan religious orgy sort of a party and they and they work themselves into this frenzy and ultimately 3,000 of them lost their lives on that day a fourth example of how they grumble and how they complain against the Lord would be that they were hungry and again familiar familiar language they say you know it would have been better that the Lord killed us in Egypt. At least we had food in Egypt. And on that day, God gave them, you may remember the story, he gives them manna, like, like food falls from heaven. And he does that for the next 40 years. And that day he causes a bunch of quail to fly into their camp and they've got, they got meat and potatoes or meat and bread or whatever. And, and God does feed them, but, but their complaining and their bitterness, their, their bad attitude, it didn't go unnoticed. And finally, one day, Moses, in his frustration, in trying to lead this rowdy bunch who, who are constantly complaining and are never thankful at how the Lord has provided for them, he, he says something really profound about dissatisfaction in life. And, and listen, friends, this is profound in that it, it's related to the dis dissatisfaction that we feel in our own lives. Exodus 16, he says this, verse 7. In the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your complaints, which are against him, not against us, me and my brother Aaron. What we have done, I'm, I'm sorry, what have we done that you should complain about us? Then Moses added, the Lord will give you meat to eat in the evening and the Lord will give you bread to satisfy you in the morning. For he has heard all your complaints against him. What have we done? Yes, your complaints are against the Lord, not against us. And this is a profound moment in Hebrews, in, in, in the history of Israel, in which, which their leader makes it clear, when you complain, when you speak words of, of bitterness, when you are deeply dissatisfied with life, your problem isn't with your wife, your husband, your children, your boss, your extended family. You think it is, but actually, you've got a problem with the Lord. You're saying, God, you really aren't that satisfying. You really don't give good gifts. You really don't have my back. And so, here's what God wants us to know about him. He said it to the nation of Israel, but thousands of years later, he hasn't changed. He says this, I am who I am. I am the Lord. I am who I say I am and, and, I, and who I have always said I was. I don't change. I, I never change. You change, but I don't change. You live in a world of cultural change and the shifting and turning of the tide culturally. It happens every year, it happens every four years, it happens every uh, decade, it happens with, with every new generation. The, the, the cultural 
tide goes this way, then that way. One day it's cool to be this way. Another, way, another day it's cool to be that way. But God says, listen, I don't change. Now, just a note here. I just want you to think about something for a moment. For those of us who are blown to and fro by the winds of cultural change, one day this way, the next day that way, the pendulum goes back and forth. You do know, right? You do know that culturally, what we think is so woke in 2021 will be so boorish in generations to come. You, you realize that because the, the target is always moving. It's always changing. So, so when we look at, when we read the Bible and we say, oh, that's, that's, that's so caveman, it's so boorish, it's so unenlightened, you realize that, that everything that we hold to in our day and age is being enlightened and culturally savvy. Three or four generations, they will look at us and they'll, they'll think that we were so old and frumpy and old fashioned. And so what do we do? Do we hold on to what culture says right now is relevant? Or do we go to the God of the Bible and we say, this is, this is the, the pen on which I will hang my hat. I mean, what makes the most sense? And I would say it is to attach ourselves to the God of the Bible who says, I am, and I don't change. Okay, so if we can just kind of review and kind of tie all this together, because I've, I've said a lot in the last few minutes, we could tie this together for today. The, the overarching theme is that God offers us this great exchange. The, the debt of sin that we owe, he takes it away. The righteousness of Christ, he places it on us. That's the story of the Bible. If you're considering being a Christ follower, that's the benefit. And then if we look at the two hurdles that we must clear, one is, I don't think I'm really that bad. I'm not sure that there is this great debt of sin that I owe. And then the second hurdle would be, okay, well, if I do have a debt of sin, like God's really going to call that, call that, call on that debt? I, somebody's got to pay for that? I mean, that, that's this crazy cosmic story of the Bible, that we have a debt of sin and that, that either I can pay that debt, spend the rest of eternity paying that debt myself, or Christ can pay that debt. So there's two hurdles. Now under that, under that big umbrella, what do we know about God today? What has God revealed to himself, to us? What is he saying about himself? Who is this God of the Bible? Well, he says to you, he says to me today, like he said to, to the Hebrews thousands of years ago, he says, listen, I'm slow to anger. I'm patient with you. I'm always inviting you to repentance, the Lord says. I'm waiting, I'm watching. It's, 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 my, it's my patience and tenderness that, that ultimately leads to your repentance. So the Lord is slow to anger. He says, number two, I shall love to the many. Now, in, in, in our elitist mindset, we tend to think like God only shows love to, to the few. To those of us who make it to church on Sunday, or to those of us who are just in, in, our, in our brand of, of religion, you know, our, our, our sort of, the, like, our uh, denomination, and, but other churches that, that maybe they've, they've got a different view on whatever. I won't get into that. But, but, like, we have this exclusive view of who God shows his love. And, and God says, I, I show my love to the many. We see that in... In the story of Jonah, like we'd think, I thought, I thought uh, that in that period of time, God was only loving the nation of Israel. And Nineveh's over there in this pagan nation called Assyria. I mean, they were the enemies of Israel. And yet God, his heart is for them as well. And what he's saying to Jonah is, look, Jonah, you think my heart is just for you? You have this exclusive view of who I am who I am drawing to myself, who I am saving. No, no, the Lord's compassion, it extends beyond my understanding. It extends beyond your understanding. 
I'm not talking about universalism. I'm not talking about how all religions are the same. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the God of the Bible saves the many through the blood of Jesus Christ, through his work on the cross. And sometimes we have a very exclusive view of what that looks like. If I could say it this way, God's compassion often, is often toward people that, that I don't show compassion toward. People that I'm intolerant of and the Lord is busy about saving them, drawing them to himself, offering them salvation through Jesus Christ's work on the cross. The, the great exchange, the gospel story, it's offered to the many. What does God say of himself? He says, he says I, am, I am the Lord slow to anger. And he says, I am the Lord who shows love to the many. And the last thing that he tells us about himself today is this. I do not leave, however, sin unpunished. And we must, we must wrestle with that. We must grapple with that. There must be a sense of urgency in my own heart regarding my own sin, that God doesn't tolerate sin, that, 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 that instead he forgives sin. It, it's, it is the essence of, of, of all that Christ has done on the cross for me. His work on the cross makes it very clear that God is very serious about my sin. He takes your sin very seriously. He doesn't sweep it under the rug. We don't trifle with God. We don't play with God. We don't act like we can just do it, how, live however we want, and God's just going to be okay with that because he doesn't take sin that seriously. No, he does. In his love, in his patience, in the slowness of his anger, what we also need to embrace is the Lord does not leave sin unpunished. There is a day in which that debt of sin is called, and it must be paid for. So I invite you to Jesus now. I invite you to, to, to the freedom, the forgiveness, the righteousness that is offered to you in Christ. Oh, my friend, you do not want to live your life saying, I'll pay my own debt, thank you very much. You know, I once saw someone, uh, a, sweet, a sweet person that was working at a fast food restaurant, but, but this person's tattoo said, uh, only, only God can judge me. And that's true, but we don't want that. We don't want the judgment of the Lord. Instead, we want, we want his forgiveness. We want his offer of salvation. We want this great exchange. That's, that's what the Lord is calling you today. And I, I, I compel you, friend, don't, don't live your life with the idea that you're your own person and you can pay your own debts. No. Run to Jesus. Run to the foot of the cross. This great exchange that the Lord has offered you, take advantage of it today. Come to Jesus, my friend, for forgiveness, that the righteousness of Christ might be placed on you. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, that's a wrap. Uh, I'm honored that you've invited me into your home today. Listen, maybe you have a question. Maybe the Lord has been working in your heart today. Maybe the, the drawing yourself drawing yourself to him. Maybe, maybe you've never really made a faith commitment to Jesus, but you're considering that. I would, I would just be honored if you would send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com. Send me an email if you have any more questions. If you say, hey, Pastor Randy, uh, the, the, I, uh, today the Lord did something in my heart. Or maybe you've got a need, a prayer request, some way that we, the elders of River Church, can serve you. Send me that email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, and we'll, we'll serve you in any way that we can. Listen, now would be a good time for you to go online and give. Everything that we do here at River Church is funded through your good gifts. If you go to our website, uh, there's, a, there's a giving button. It's quick and easy, intuitive and safe. And many of you give, and I thank you, many of you give generously through, the, through our website. During this age of COVID, that's how many of you are giving. And, and we wouldn't be able to keep the doors open without you. So I say thank you. I would encourage you right now to go to the website and, and give. If you'd like to get connected in one of our uh, small groups. We call them gospel communities, like Bible studies or home groups. Uh, if you'd like to get connected, but maybe you're still self-isolating, we have a few that meet online every week. So again, send me an email and we will get you connected. Okay, well, 
Uh, I, I'm praying for you. I miss seeing you face to face. I look forward to that day. I'm kind of, I'm kind of thinking the, the light is, is at the end of the tunnel. I'm beginning to see it. Those days are ahead of us where we can regather as an entire church. Looking forward to that. Praying for you, my friends. Love you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day.